podcasting's choice from coast to coast, continent to continent, right here 24 7. Blueberry. This podcast is a member of the Blueberry Network. Blueberry. No ease. That's blueberry, B L U B R R Y. Dot com. Blueberry dot com. This podcast is a proud member of the Lamb Podcasting Network. Find the network at largeassmovieblogs.com. Okay, looking that way and not over there. Okay, coast is clear. Mm-hmm. What you doing? <laughs> Woman, I'm going to hurt you in a minute. Will you stop trying to look at my list? Sorry. Cheater. I'm not cheating. I'm just practicing. Practicing that- for what? Ninjutsu for dummies. Oh, for pizza. How do you think I've been able to be so quietly sneaking up on you? This book was great. It's not a skill you need to use around the house. Outside toy. Okay. From PNR Networks at eCinema1.com, this is Subject Cinema's The Best of the 2010s. Hey, kids! No, 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 we're not. It's time for Subject Cinema's Best of the 2010s Part Two. I'm T.C. Kirkham. I'm Kim Brown. What have I told you about doing the Binky voice? We do not need the Binky the Clown voice. <laughs> then we, you need to stop stealthing around here. We already had It Chapter Two come out. This, I don't do the, this the, year. I don't care who. I don't care if Finn Wolfhard's in them. I'm not going to go. Well, that's what them. I mean. We've had enough of the chlorophobia this year, so let's not. Well, include... We haven't seen Wrinkles the Clown yet either. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, welcome to our second of three monster specials saluting the decade. I... We are going back in time and bringing you our top thirty favorite narrative and documentary films mm-hmm. for the 2010s. Yep. The period January 30, uh, January 1st, 2010 through October 30th, 2019, because we haven't seen anything in November, mm-hmm. because as you guys know, we've had some crazy stuff going on around here the last few months. Yep. Um, it, it, yesterday, we went through our number 30 through 21, yes. and today, I guess that means it's going to be 20 through 11. Yes, that's what it, that's what it would mean, yes. <laughs> And, uh, and so, I mean, yesterday, last show, it's yep. going to be not yesterday. It's yesterday when we taped it. Um, yeah, so don't say yesterday. Say last show if we have to refer to something we talked okay. about on show one. Okay. Anyway, um, so today you're going to get our uh, 20 through 11 narratives and uh, documentaries. We ran down our criteria. These are kind of like our best and our favorite all rolled into one. Mm-hmm. We all have our own weird judging criteria. Yep. And, and, uh, so we, we encourage you to let us know what your favorite films of the decade are by dropping us a line at subject cinema at pnrnetworks.com. <laughs> Those of you who wish to do so, mm-hmm. we will read them on one of our year end shows. Yep. And it will be a, lots of fun. Yes, it will. Let's get started with number 20. On the uh, documentaries list. Mm-hmm. Um, I started yesterday, so maybe you should start. You want me to start this yeah, year? Yeah, I okay. think that's only fair. I'll do documentaries first today, then. My number 20 documentary is the film that won my Best Documentary Award in 2016. It is a delightful little slice of life with some people who are actually out, who have actually outlived the birth of the country they live in. It is absolutely brilliant. My number 20 is Alex... Uh, Fagan's wonderful 2016 documentary, Older Than Ireland. I loved this film. Uh, we It played at the um, Irish Film Festival. We didn't get a chance to see it that year. Mm-hmm. And it came out, and it, and it actually ran. 
you know, most of these kind of documentaries will spend a week in the theater. Even in Boston, they usually only spend a week um, at one of the art fit theaters. Mm-hmm. Older Than Ireland ran six weeks at the Kendall Square Cinema. This yep. thing was popular out the wazoo. Um, it's delightful. Everybody in the film is older than 100 years of age. And and it's delightfully funny. Some of the stu- some of the, some of the people you have trouble understanding. Thankfully, there are subtitles. Yes. And 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 it is. You and I both sat there, and we it was just the sweetest thing we've ever seen, and funny in so many ways. Um, featuring among the people featured in the movie were Winifred Anderson, Bridget Aspel, Dolly Atley, Jimmy Berry, Finn Brennan, uh, Ellie Lothar. Let me pull up the rest of them. Luke Dolan. Kathleen Snavely, Mary O'Leary, Delia Henry, Dorothea Finlater, Jack Powell, John Mitchell, Margaret Heffernan, Jackie Sullivan, Bessie Nolan, Mary Kilroy, Michael O'Connor, Rose O'Halloran, Eileen Doyle, Margaret Kelly, May Spain, Una Reed, Mary Sissy McCauley, Kathleen Brennan, Kathy Fingleton, Kathleen Fostyke, Anna Kathleen, and Madge Fanning. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't know if I don't know if all of them are still with us. Uh, it's been four years since it shot. Yeah. But it, this movie is available on Amazon Prime. If you have not seen it, it will charm the socks off of you. It is a wonderful, beautiful film. Number twenty on my documentaries list for the decade: Older Than Ireland from 2016. Okay, my number twenty best documentary of the decade is a film that you've actually already mentioned. Oh. Uh, my number 20 is um, Jason Becker, Not Dead Yet. Yeah, we talked about that yesterday. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jason Becker, as, as I can't or say... Last show. Sorry. Yeah, I can't say anything more about it than you already mentioned. Jason <coughs> is an amazing guitarist who hasn't let something like a life-altering disease keep him from doing what he was put on this planet to do, make incredible music. Uh, this film is from 2012. Uh, Jason is an inspiration. He is an amazing human being. And he's still going. And he's, he's still, still <laughs> going strong. And, th- I mean, I, I can't say enough amazing things about Jason because they haven't invented words <laughs> that are, are the, the, run the gamut of how strong a human being and how uncrushable Jason's spirit are is and his he's just I, I keep flinging the word inspiration around I don't mean to ma- I'm not trying to make it sound like that's just a word because right, right. it's not he is he is the true definition of too crazy to die yeah you know and he's just an amazing human being he is proof that human beings can soar mm-hmm. even if your legs are tied to an anchor <laughs> um my number 20 jason becker not dead yet you can go back to show one and hear what i had to say mm-hmm. it was number 29 on mm-hmm. my list number 19 um when it comes to documentaries quite often i will gravitate toward a series of documentary makers uh, i adore april wright who made coming attractions or going attractions uh, i i really um, have loved, uh, I love Crystal Moselle. I haven't seen her first narrative film yet, but The Wolf Pack was amazing. And I love documentarian Penny Lane. She has done some amazing stuff. Oh, Ian Chaney also, another one. Um, Penny Lane, uh, first did a movie that I had not seen at the time I saw the movie at number 19 yet, called Our Nixon. It was a story about, re- the, the story of Richard Nixon as told by, strictly by archival footage. Uh, I have seen it since then, and it's a pretty amazing film. More recently, this year, she made one of my favorite documentaries of 2019, the ubiquitous Hail Satan, which uh, talks about um, the satanic church and how they've used it as a political weapon rather than a religious weapon. Um, it's a really fascinating film if you should get a chance to see it. In between those two films was a little gem that didn't get seen too much, but both Kim and I loved it, and, and it was a movie that we totally got suckered by. And <laughs> she has a very Orson Wellesian way of throwing these twists into her films that you don't expect. My number sixteen, my number nineteen is 2016's Nuts! Exclamation point. The story of John R. Brinkley, um, who was a medical doctor, Dr. Evil quotes, and, and radio magnet back in the 1920s and 30s. Um, the film is told through some brilliant animation, uh, some stop motion animation, some 
paper animation. It is just really amazing. Um, you will get suckered into this, though. I've got to be honest. There's a, At the end of the film, you're like, what? What? Because all through this film, you are really getting angrier and angrier at the people that are hassling poor Dr. Brinkley. And then she kicks you in the in the in the in the title uh, the movie title. Yeah. Um, Even it, if you don't have them, <laughs> like me, it, <laughs> is, it is brilliant. It is funny as hell, and it truly is an amazing story of what this guy managed to pull off in the twenties and thirties uh, as a radio broadcaster. He was the Doctor Oz, or or the. Um, you know, not in the in the, what he actually is, but in the way he deli- you know his style. Where he I actually, um, that's not a good example. Um, more along the lines of maybe an Alex Jones, only for the medical set. Yeah, the, uh, back then. Yeah, where you because Doctor Oz is an actual doctor. Yes, he is, mm-hmm. and I didn't mean to t- say that. He's a very interesting and and, and very per- you know personable and knowledgeable guy. Yep. Um, but um, he, this is this is just an amazing film. If you haven't seen it. It should be on Netflix or on Amazon Prime. Check it out because you will find yourself with your jaw hanging down at the end of the film. Mm -hmm. My number 19 documentary of the 2010s is Penny Lane's Marvelous Nut! Exclamation point. Yep. Um, One thing that you're going to notice in the films from my list this this show as we're doing this, there's, there's quite a few films on my list in this section that have to do with a subject that is near and dear to both of our hearts, and that is music. Okay. Um, and this film was, uh, when we saw this film, I was like, I'm not sure I'm going to get this. But by the end of this film, I was like, not only do I get it, I love it, and I want to go there. Uh, my number 19 is Passione. Uh, Passione is a film that, was uh, directed by actor John Turturro. This is definitely a passion project of his. Um, it a passione is project. Passi- for his. Passione project. That's <laughs> that's very nice. That's good. Um, it's from 2010. It is a film looking at the music of a specific section of Italy. Yeah, just quickly. 2011 release, but 2010 film festivals. Mm-hmm. Just want to get that straight. Okay. Specifically, Either the way, area, the area around Napoli, Italy, and which would be called the Neapolitan style of music, or Naples, if you're from America, or Naples, you know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and this is, for one thing, you're watching all of you, know, you have all of these people singing all different styles of music from romantic to tragic to slightly cheeky to everything in between. And they're singing it in these incredible architectural places, these buildings that have been there for hundreds of years. And there's so much life in Passione. There's just, there's so much, there's a line that we toss around all the time from a film, ironically, that I've never seen, but I do agree with. There is a line from Empire Records. Um, You've seen Empire I've Records. I've seen You've seen it all the way through at least yeah. once. Uh, there's a line uh, about music being the glue that holds... Music the- is the glue of the world, Mark. It holds the world together. Without it, life would be meaningless. Yeah. And this film is definite proof that if we didn't have music, we'd only be living half our lives. Mm-hmm. Because these people throw 195% of their lives into performing their music. My number 19, Passione. Yep. It's a great choice. Um, my number 18 is also about music. And again, like you, it opened my eyes to something I'd never really gotten involved with before. Um, I'm a music lover from way back. You guys know I have my music site, the Kirkham Report, out there. I did, I've done my own music charts for off and on for 40 some years. Um, I been, began collecting records when I was three, thanks to my mother. Um, so over fifty years now, I I I um I like all different types of music, and I was always a disco fan. I mean, it's no secret to our listeners I was a disco fan, and I, I'm like dance music, but I'd never really gotten into the music of the 1990s and 2000s that called itself electronic dance music, or EDM. 
Um, I had heard, I, I had become a fan here and there of certain songs. I liked some Daft Pump. I like a couple of Avicii songs at the time. But I hadn't really, I, the culture just kind of wowed me because it had such a bad reputation from, for drug usage and, you know, breaking into abandoned buildings to hold raves and stuff. My perception of that culture changed entirely with my number 18 film, 2014's Under the Electric Sky. Uh, which is also my number 18. Really? The documentary same film, yep. That, wow. Okay, I didn't think we'd do that at any time on this list. <laughs> Under the Electric Sky is the documentary show of the Electric Daisy Carnival from 2013 in Las Vegas. They have this every year. Uh, usually the first week in June, and it's usually held at Las Vegas Speedway. Um, and groups of people, kids from all over the country, including a group from here in Massachusetts, mm-hmm. um, that went to find themselves at this festival. Mm-hmm. I'd never seen anything like this. I showed her, after I'd seen it, I showed her when it was on, I think Axis ran it a couple years ago when I we watched so, it. I think so, yeah. And, and, um, now, and not only did I really find Avicii after I saw this, I became an enormous fan of his, but I have found so many other artists because of this movie that I just adore. Um, and I... It didn't get the best reviews, which is a shame, because it truly is a real chronicle of real people enjoying real music and what they like. Mm-hmm. The nicest thing about EDM, they don't care if you're black, white, green, yellow, purple, polka dot, plaid, straight, gay, cisgender, bisexual, non-gender... They don't care. 18 or 80. You are there to have fun. As long as you're there to enjoy the music and have fun and not bother anybody else, you're welcome. It's marvelous. Mm -hmm. Kim and I, I've tried to talk Kim into going, and she's like, are you kidding? We'd be the oldest people there. Yeah, we probably would be. We would be. Except for the people that like run the marriages and stuff that are there. Yeah. But I love this film. It just fills you with this wonderful uplifting positive sense of, yeah it's positive terrific. energy yes there are mentions of drugs particularly molly here and there but um it it's it's an amazing so if it's num- your number 18 why don't you talk about it for a minute or two under the electric sky is a definite example of a documentary that i came out of knowing something that i didn't know when i went into yeah, it now because too. usually my my exposure to edm music before that was hearing on the news about some teenager winding up dead from yeah. Molly or some building yeah. getting broken into so people could have a rave and blah, 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 etc., so on and so forth. And just being like, well, that's what kids do these days. But I watched this film and being like, wow, this really opened my eyes to the culture, to the lifestyle, to the music, and it's loud and frenetic and nuts and beautiful. Mm-hmm. And it, it, it also really opened my eyes to Avicii, who left us way too soon. Way too soon. And, and whose, whose loss is still felt in the EDM community. And um, love to him. Yeah. Raise your wands. Absolutely. Um, but it's just... And you saw the kids that came to, um, to the carnival yeah. honoring their friend who had died. And yeah, those, those were the were kids the from, from Massachusetts. Massachusetts. And I was like, I Who know. Died, died of a drug overdose, we should. You know, and out. I was yeah. like, I know those guys. You know, I mean, I mean, I know them personally. We know what they are. I know those. They're from somewhere on the Cape. Yeah, I know where. those guys as in those are the guys I went to school with. Those are the guys I went to college with. Those are the guys I was in yeah. shows with. Yeah. You know, and they're just young people trying to find their way in the world and they found this music that brings them together and for a moment the world and all of its problems and divisions and hatred and stupidity and violence is outside yeah and it's not touching them Uh, for for just a little bit of time one of the best things about the film to me is the couple the long distance relationship couple Uh who make a point to get together at edm every year edc every year she is from somewhere close to the east coast if i remember right he was working in Japan, mm-hmm. and they flew and met up in Las Vegas for this. And of all and the places they could go, they wanted to go there. Yeah. And I think that's amazing. Dressed in their goofy superhero costumes every night and yeah. having the time of their lives. Yeah. And it, it's just an amazing film. So our number 18, Both together, of ours, yep. 
from 2014, The Incredible, uh, from, from, uh, directors Dan Cutforth and Jane Lipsitz, Under the Electric Sky. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, does that mean it's mine? That means to move, so you're number 18, so yeah. I'll move over to number 17 then. Okay. Um, no, I wrote because mm-hmm. you just did. I know. Um, my, go from that to, to this. This is a complete opposite, and it came out in the same year. Um, the n- film at number 17 on my documentary list for, two th- for the 2010s is a Sundance winner. It was an Oscar nominee. It is an amazing film that follows the lives of three kids, teenagers, in a small Missouri town and what their lives look like in everyday life after the main, uh, after the main employer left town um it's very hard to take in many ways because you feel for one of these kids who is just a really sweet kid you feel for another one because of what he's been through and the third one is so totally obnoxious you want to smash him in the face um the the film uh from tracy draws tragos and andrew draws palermo is rich hill this film um will gut you at the end with the messages that come up because something terrible happened to one of them after the film stopped. And um, not to them, but to their family. And mm-hmm. and it was... I was sitting there bawling, the, um, not even half listening to Tracy uh, and um, the other producer guy, I think it was David Armelli, that were there at the Salem Film Festival where we saw it. Um, it, it's just truly an amazing film that will reach in and touch your heart. And Andrew and Harley and Apache are three unusual young kids, all of them between 11 and 14, who are trying to make the best they can of the li- what's life given them, has, has dealt them. Mm-hmm. It makes you feel like you don't have any problems anymore. Yep. There's quite a few of these on this list that do that. Um, I urge you to check it out. It's run, it, it's available on PBS's, um, app from when it ran on, um, um, POV, I think. It's also available on either Amazon or Netflix. I forget which one. If you haven't seen it, watch it. You won't forget it. Number four, uh, 17, Rich Hill. Okay. Number 17 is a film that we actually saw this year, and oh. um, it was, I loved it. I went into this film, I the minute I heard they were doing this, I was like, oh my gosh, I have to see this movie. Uh, my number 17 is Eye of the Beholder, The Art of Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> I have... This got such a tiny release, too. I know. We saw it at the, at the Sci-Fi Film Festival. Uh-huh. It got a release in just four theaters about two months later. And now it's on, it is on uh, Amazon Prime, if mm-hmm. you haven't seen it. yeah. I've mentioned numerous times that I am a gamer uh, when, it, uh, when it comes to d and I've been one since I was much, much younger. Ironically, I became one during the time when all the satanic panic nonsense <gasps> was going on. But, Shame on you. But thankfully, my parents were actually smart enough to realize that she's not getting sucked into something that's going to hurt her. It's just because she's got a great imagination, so let her run with it. And one of the things that always drew me to D&D was the artwork. The artwork on the book covers, the artwork inside the books. I was always looking at this art and being like, wow, this is so incredible. Who does this stuff? And this film shows you the people that did this stuff. And they're all people that draw because they have been blessed with the ability to see this stuff in their head and then be able to put it on paper. And boy, I wish I had that talent because then I wouldn't have some of the stuff in my head that I do. Um, it's, it's a great movie. It's really fun for those of us who are old school D&D fans because we see a lot of yeah. the, the imagery from a lot of the older books. And I'm, this this is really bad because I was sitting there going, had that book, had that book, had that book, had we that were, book, yeah. had that book. Oh gosh, I'm a geek, you know. But that's okay. I, I embraced my inner nerd a long time ago. So my number seventeen, Eye of the Beholder, The Art of Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, it's a great movie. Love um, it. My number sixteen. Um, it, I, Kim does not. Kim and I have different tastes in documentaries. 
I tend to go for historical ones that are sometimes tough to take uh, over the, uh, the smaller ones where she will look and gravitate toward things with bunnies and kitties and, and stuff. Yeah. Duckies and one, bunnies. That's this is one that she didn't see. And and I, I don't think she would have been able to sit through it if she had. Um, there is um, a lot to be remembered about World War II and what happened in World War II. Um, some of the most barbaric acts of, of humanity's history happened during World War II. True. And my number 16 looks at one particular person and his philosophy. And... It is told through the calm, sweet words of love letters written between a military officer and his wife, and also mentioning his 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 uh, his his uh, uh, daughter and later an, a, a mistress. And it makes you realize this guy thought all of this was one hundred percent normal even though he was the architect of the death camps. Mm -hmm. My number 16 is 2014's documentary, The Decent One. Well, see, this film, I know I haven't seen it, but this film leads into the theory that I've always had. Nobody thinks they're the bad guy. Right, yeah. Nobody, even the Nazis, didn't think they were the bad guys, right. and trust me, they were. Um, Vanessa Lapa has put together an amazing portrait of Heinrich Himmler, uh, told through the stories of letters and diary entries that were published in the German newspaper Die Welt in the 1990s. Um, they were authenticated. It's not like the Hitler diaries that were a fake in the 80s. Um, and this, I mean, he and his wife in these letters are talking calmly about how he's executing hundreds of people mm-hmm. and how, oh, they all deserve to die and, and how they can never be true German stock. And I'm sitting there trying not to throw up. I'm, I'm my God, yeah. you know, even the most lunatic person in the world has to realize what this man did was horrific. And... He thought it was just perfectly normal. Actually, can I ask you a question about that? Sure. Do you think a film like that is dangerous because it normalizes oh, someone? Oh, no, it doesn't normalize it at all. It makes him show for the monster he is. Okay. Because most people looking at this are going to say, my God, what is this? what was wrong with this man? Mm-hmm. Um, it's an amazing film. If you get a chance to check it out, check online, check uh, streaming services. If you're into World War II and you haven't seen this, you should. It is. It, it will chill you to the bone. Number 16, The Decent One from 2014. Okay. Uh, number uh, 16 on my list is incredibly bittersweet um, because that's just the way life goes. Um, we lost this person very recently as we're recording this. Um, and we were blessed. I think that would be the right term for it. We were blessed to be able to see this person and a friend of theirs, um, back when this film debuted in Boston, in Cambridge actually, at the Brattle, back in 2005. Oh. 15? I think. Sometime. 2014, yeah. 2015, somewhere yeah. in there. My number 16 is I Am Big Bird, the Carol Spinney story. Uh, this film looks at Carol Spinney, the gentleman who was the puppeteer and the voice of beloved Sesame Street characters Big Bird and Oscar the Grouch. Pretty much from Sesame Street's inception mm-hmm. all the way to... The last year. Uh, t- yeah. Uh, w- uh, when he being, you know up there in years, had passed the mantle of Big Bird and Oscar on to another actor. Uh, It is a really amazing film looking at a person that a lot of people, I don't think it's unfair to say it this way, and I don't think I'm being melodramatic, literally grew up with. Yeah. You know, and they didn't know it. They never knew the face behind the the puppets. Mm Mm-hmm. As I said, he was at the Brattle with his lovely wife when we we were able to see this film. He was also at the Salem Film Festival when they played up there after we left for that yeah. year. We'd already seen it at the Brattle before mm-hmm. that. so. Mm-hmm. 
And because um, he lived he, in Connecticut, it yeah, far he talked for a little bit with us as the audience, and then he left the stage for a moment, and Oscar's head poked around the side of the stage, <laughs> and in an, an entire sold-out brattle full of allegedly grown-up adults. <laughs> Yelled and screamed and clapped and applauded like we were all five year olds <laughs> at a Sesame Street concert. And it was beautiful. It was. It was so beautiful. And that is something that I'm going to hold very close to my heart yeah. for the rest of my life. Um, as I mentioned, we lost him recently. And Just last week, as a yeah, matter of fact. And damn it, that hurt. Yeah. You know, and, but this, we have this film. To remind us what a wonderful person he was. And this is a personal thing on just me. And I know it comes off very hippy dippy crunchy earthy <laughs> granola, but you it's, never. I have a theory that if when you talk about someone who has passed from this plane of existence into whatever you think goes beyond here, and you may think nothing is beyond here, and that's fine too. Mm-hmm. But if when you talk about a person, that memory makes you smile, then they're not gone. And in that case, Carol Spinney is going to be immortal. Yeah, he will be. And um, <laughs> I'm going to stop talking before I start crying. Um, <laughs> my number 16, I Am Big Bird, The Carol Spinney Story. We'll be back with our 20 through 16 narratives. When Subject Cinema returns. Times and great movies. Subject Cinema. eCinema One is your choice for great info and commentary about the world of film and entertainment. Daily trailer postings, the latest news and film reviews, commentary about the state of the industry, the weekly subject cinema and three-minute weekend podcast, and so much more you won't believe it. New material is being posted daily. So join us each day and see what you're missing out on. Once you visit, you will always be back for more. eCinema One from PNR Networks, eCinemaOne.com. Probably can't cover the thousands of films made every year, but it's sure a lot of fun to try. Subject Cinema. We are looking at the best of the 2010s here on Subject Cinema, and we're really glad you're with us doing it. I'm Kim Brown. I'm T.C. Kirkham. It's Subject Cinema's best of the 2010s three-part special. Yeah. And we hope that you enjoy listening to what we have uh, determined are our favorite and best films of the past decade. Mm-hmm. No doubt uh, the critics would argue we had there's so many great critical favorites that we never saw and never yeah. had a chance. So these are where we're going by the somewhat close to 500 films we saw over the last decade. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's hard to believe we actually saw that many. I know, it's crazy. <coughs> we're going to Some go of them we saw all on the same day and man, that got exhausting. Well, we only <laughs> I think the most we ever did in one day was four, four. or maybe five. I think it was at four. At one of the independent film festivals. Yeah. Uh Boston mm-hmm. uh, shows. I think yep. that was the day we saw Loneliest Planet, I Wish, and a couple of other things all on the same day. It, it, was it that or the day we saw 13 Assassins could have been that and the day other too, We saw the a bunch other that things. day, too. Yeah, I think I thought that, that might was might be the it. same all the same day. Oh, yeah. I don't know. I'm not sure. <laughs> anyway. No, I don't think so. Um, let's get back into our countdown mm-hmm. and our narratives list with our 20 through 16. And you can start with this since I did the documentaries first. Yep. Okay, my <laughs> number 20 narrative is... Um, I I thought this movie was great. I knew it was going to be great, but I didn't know it was going to be this great. And I had so much fun and thought it was just an amazing, exciting way to introduce a character that at the time wasn't that well known to people who weren't real deep superhero fans. Uh, My number 20 from 2011, Thor, from Marvel Studios, directed by Kenneth Branagh. Um, Thor brought to the screen the story of the the god of thunder, Thor, and all of the characters <laughs> of well, that. all of the characters of Asgard, including <laughs> Thor's father Odin, his mother Frigga, and, and Asgard, and Kenny, and um, <laughs> private joke, and Thor's now, people, I'm sure, get it out there anyway. His brother Loki. Um, 
And all of the things that happened in that with the whole, you know, Thor's origin story of being banished to Earth because of his pride. And I know some people are like, well, it's a superhero movie. What can it teach me? This movie actually can teach you a lot. Besides the fact that it taught me, oh, that's what Chris Hemsworth looks like. I've heard a lot about him. Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, talk about a God you'd go on your knees for. Anyway, moving All forward, right. we're over here now. But this film actually does have a lot to say, and it does have lot, a lot to teach. And one of the things it teaches is that to be a king, to be a leader isn't about the crown and the robe and all the people, you know, kneeling to kiss your ring and all that stuff. It's about what you're willing to give up because a king and a true leader has to be willing to give up their lives for their people. Right. And that's something Thor has to learn during this film. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's some really funny parts. There's some really great parts. Natalie Portman is really wonderful in this film. Kat Dennings picks up and walks away her scenes, you know, because she's just awesome. Anyway, love you, Kat. And it's just, it's just fun. I just enjoyed it. I thought it was a great film. And it also has a lot to say about identity. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, is, is your place in your family is that your identity, or right. do you make that yourself? Right. Mm-hmm. My number twenty, Thor. Uh, my number twenty narrative of the of the two thousand tens is actually I may I miscounted yesterday one of the seven foreign language films I have in my top thirty. Mm-hmm. I said six yesterday because I forgot about this one. This is also in foreign language. Okay. Um, it is um, it is scary. It is fall down funny. And the special effects are amazing when you consider it was made for 3.5 million American dollars. Mm -hmm. And if you look at it, it's like, wow, they did all of that with that limited budget? We found out when are continuing to find out throughout the decade that Norway is very, very frugal with their money. And it pays off in big ways. My number 20 is the marvelously hilarious and terrifying found footage documentary, uh, uh, mockumentary, Troll Hunter. Um, this film was a rave at Sundance from day one. It made its way here at the Independent Film Festival Boston, where we sat one Friday night after a long day of work and uh just were like oh my god this movie is absolutely off the ra- off the rails mm-hmm. it's hilarious it's terrifying the effects are amazing it's Even, one of the very few found footage movies that did not make me nauseous because that whole shaky cam thing. Yeah, but it's worse in this movie than anything else we've seen. Yeah, which but is it, really that, crazy. it's weird though. For the once, it doesn't bother me. Starring, um, starring uh, Norwegian comedian Otto Jesperson as Hans, uh, and uh, the troll hunter of the title, who is being followed around by a student film crew yeah. trying to prove that he's a bear poacher. They don't yep. realize what's really going on. If it was only bears he was dealing with, they would be lucky. <laughs> uh, they're played by uh, um, to- Thomas Alf Larsen, Joanna Mernick, the wonderful Glenn Erland Toast, Rude as their, uh, now Glenn Fallick, as their leader, Thomas. And uh, it is, uh, it, I mean, really... Norway has surprised me in Mm -hmm. what they can get out of their money. And I I keep saying, Hollywood needs to look to Norway. Because when you have movies made this well with that kind of special effects that are so well done for under $5 Mm -hmm. you know this is another movie that's been optioned by an American film company. You know when they do it, it's going to cost $120 million. Why? Uh, and more to the point, why bother when the original is so the, good? The original is so good in the ending. <laughs> when you get to the ending and there's that last little, oh, say what well, moment? Well, there, there's know. that moment, but then yeah. there's the next ending, which is hilariously funny. Mm. Um, you have to see it to believe it, and it is awesome. Number 20 on my narrative films of the decade, 2011's Troll Hunter from Norway. Okay. Number 19 on my narrative list is a film that I absolutely adored. I thought this film was just wonderful. The story was amazing. The look of the film is gorgeous. And it's also one of these films that introduced another Disney princess that is very much different from your old-fashioned someday my prince will come type, (laughs) you know, this one 
is all about the fact that this is a princess that can save herself, thank you, and not only saves herself, but also saves her people. I mean, granted, she does do it with the help of a wise-cracking demigod, but you know, <laughs> we can all use a hand every once in a while, even if that hand belongs to a rather egotistical guy. Uh, my number 19 is Moana from 2016. Amazing film. Moana tells the story of a young uh, girl who is the daughter of a Polynesian chief. And when a mysterious blight starts hitting all of the islands in the area, including hers, Moana goes on a journey to find a relic that will save her island and her people and get some help. Well, it is help, reluctant help, Mm -hmm. along the way from Maui, the demigod, voiced hilariously by Dwayne The Rock Johnson. If nothing else, the song You're Welcome is a frickin' scream. I also want to bring up definitely the young lady who voiced Moana. Um, I'm going to mess up your name, honey. Yeah. I'm so sorry. Oli Cravalito. Car- Car- I think I said that is sort of close to correct. And <laughs> if I didn't, I'm so super duper sorry. Um, and... She is just fantastic. The, the song from the film, um, How Far I'll Go, which is just absolutely glorious. It is a great film. It's funny. It's scary. It's got some wonderful moments in it and some very sly digs on other Disney films, too. It's just great. My number 19, Moana. That's your number 19? Yep. Oh, you went first on this, didn't you? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute, where's our number 20? All right, uh, my number 19 um, <coughs> is another uh, foreign language film. Uh, we actually saw it on DVD because we had no choice. It never came to the area. Not that I'm aware of. If it did, it was here very shortly. Mm-hmm. Um, it is a marvelously, lushly animated film from France that blew our minds when we saw it. We were like... What is the, you know, is it good? We, we saw it on the recommendation of one of our friends from Clotrudis. Mm-hmm. And, and it just completely left us speechless. Um, my number, it was released here in the States with an uh, um, English language dial, uh, 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 dialogue by Debbie. the kids. Yeah. We saw the original with the, uh, America, with the, uh, English subtitles and in French. Uh, the movie in French is called Le Tableau. It is known in America as The Painting mm-hmm. from 2011 uh, and 2012 in America, I believe. Yeah, 2013 in America. Um, it tells the story of characters who a painter, a mysterious painter, has worked on all of them, but he's left them in various stages of, of production. Mm-hmm. There are the Aldons who can occupy the mansion and are the ones who are, you know, uh, completely finished. The Halfies who lack a few colors and the Sketchies who are just sketches. Um, it's a, it's a story of, of the class system of mm-hmm. France. Yep. Um, it's beautifully animated, wonderfully acted by the French language, uh, actors and, and just, the subtitles are, are perfect. I mean, you can understand and get everything out of it, unlike some subtitles from this decade, like film socialism. Um, it is um, it, it's, it is a feast for the eyes. The music is great, uh, done by Pascal Le Pinnick. And um, if you get a chance to see it, you may find it under either title. Um, and sometimes you will find it under the painting, but it's still the original French language, which is what you want. Mm-hmm. Um it's beautiful, and it, it, it will amaze you. Number 19, 2013's The Painting from France. Number 18 is a film that we saw, once again, at the Boston Underground Film Festival. Oh, um, and I believe we saw this at when it was still being held at the Kendall. I'm pretty sure. Um, this film disturbed me. I mean, this film sunk its claws into my brain and was a film that I had screaming nightmares yes, she about. Did. Um, now, I say that as an avowed horror movie fan. Now, I am an admittedly a classic horror movie fan. I like some of the newer stuff, but 
I prefer monsters. You know, make mine monsters. That's my attitude. Well, this Dracula movie has monsters. Yeah, Dracula, Frankenstein, the Mummy, yeah, all type that. Of monsters. Yeah, the thing is, this movie shows that some of the scariest monsters out there look like your neighbor. Could be the man you're sleeping with. Yeah. My number eighteen uh, from 2010, directed by Adam Wingard, A Horrible Way to Die. Yeah, this was his first breakthrough film, and he's become if a major director If you seek now. this film out, which I would definitely recommend <laughs> you do, do yourself a favor. Do not watch this film alone. Yeah, we watched it together, and, and, she, and she's not kidding. She woke up that night literally screaming. Yep. Which I had never seen her do. Mm-mm. Not from a movie, no. No. Watch this movie with someone you trust with all the lights on. Even <laughs> if you're not in the room, I don't care. Turn all the lights on. The, the story of A Horrible Way to Die is about a, a woman. Um, her name in the film is Karen. Um, I think. Let me just check real quick. No, Sarah. I'm sorry, Sarah. Um, Sarah, who is played by Amy Simons. Si- who was in a relationship with Garrick, and at the time that she was in a relationship with Garrick, she was drinking a lot, and that might have been part of the reason she didn't notice what was going on with Garrick, because Garrick is a monster. And when I say Garrick is a monster, I don't mean Garrick turns into a werewolf or something like that. He is a serial killer. And he gets caught, he gets put in jail, she tries to move on with her life, and then Garrick escapes, and stuff goes real sideways. Um, A.J. Bowen, who plays Garrick, is terrifying. He is one of the most terrifying movie monsters I have ever seen in my life. And he is proof that even if you're a human being as a monster, you don't have to be seven foot tall with a hockey mask and a machete you know, and all that stuff to be scary. This movie freaking haunted my dreams. Yeah. My number 18, A Horrible Way to Die. Mm-hmm. Check it out, but don't say I didn't warn you. Yep. My number 18 is one of those films I really sincerely think that if it had gotten a major studio behind it, they would have and, and, and got the right people on, on it. It could have been an Oscar contender. Um, as such, it was an indie film that barely got released and, and uh, deserved so much more than it got. Thankfully, it is available for the masses to see on Amazon Prime, and if you haven't seen it, you should. It is the story of a couple of friends from rural Kentucky, one of whom is going through a gender reassignment, and the love and lives, uh, the, the, the love lives that they are both seeking, not sure where they are going. The film is 2014's Boy Meets Girl, starring my, uh, Michael Welsh as Robbie, uh, best bud to Michelle Henley as Ricky. Uh, for Robbie, it's very awkward because he knew Ricky when Ricky was a boy. That they were best friends from grade school. And to his credit, they've stayed best friends even yeah. though he's almost done with his gender reassignment. Mm-hmm. Um, Michelle Henley, uh, one of the most finest young actresses on the planet really does a terrific job mm-hmm. with making the real life, her own, I mean, she lives through it too, she is also a transgender actress, um, really uh, brings so much love and heart to this film. Yep. Um, along with cast members Alexander Tertian and Michael Galante as the other main characters. Um, you have to see it to understand it. And you, it's great that it's, ha- it, it, if I find it strange that a relationship like this is set in Kentucky. She's trying to get to New York where she wants to go to fashion school. Mm -hmm. And uh, right now she's working as a barista and still hanging out with best friend Robbie. Um, It's a truly charming, wonderfully funny, and deeply poignant film that deserves so much more Mm -hmm. than it got. Mm -hmm. Number 18 on my list, 2014's Eric Schaefer Masterpiece. Boy Meets Girl. Okay. Number 17 on my list is another foray into the superhero genre. Uh, number, uh, uh, from 2011, directed by Joe Johnston, my number 17, Captain America, the first Avenger. Captain America is the story of Steve Rogers, a.k.a. Captain America, a young man who winds up 
going through an experimental process to try and become, y'all remember that old saying that the army used to use to be all you can be. <laughs> and through the, through the super soldier serum that he is injected with. Say which, that fast. Super soldier serum. Super soldier, you can't. Yeah, you can't. Yeah. So. <laughs> you can't either. I wouldn't even try. It's, you know, <laughs> no, because I'd bite my tongue, there'd be blood, and there would be all kinds of problems. Okay, fair um, <laughs> this, is a it's a great story, yep. and the thing that I find so interesting about the story is that um, <laughs> Steve played incredibly well by uh, Chris Evans, hometown boy represent. Um, is the fact that at the beginning of the story, when Steve, you know, becomes Captain America, do they send him out to instantly go out and punch Hitler in the face like they did in the comics and all that? No. The army, in their infinite wisdom, that's an oxymoron if I ever heard one. Well, um, Tommy Lee Jones. Their whole thing is they're, they're going to use him as a propaganda you know, figure. And that's not what Steve wants. Steve wants to fight for his country. And I love the fact that they have one line, and I think this line sums up Steve and who he is. I don't like bullies. It doesn't matter where they're from. <laughs> That's who Steve Rogers is. He's a good person. And I think it's so interesting that his the the dark shadow to him in this film, uh Johann Schmidt, the the person who is actually part of a group that are even worse than the Nazis, the the fictional terrorist organization Hydra. That's pretty bad if you're even worse than Nazis. You've really crossed over into the dark side. Uh, played terrifyingly by Hugo Weaving. Um, their scenes together are so good because they really are the different sides of the same coin. It, the whole thing about that this, this serum makes a good man better and makes a bad man worse is so exemplified in their scenes. I loved this film, and I thought it was a terrific addition to the building blocks that have made the Marvel movie universe what it is. DC, really, seriously, take some friggin' notes. <laughs> um, my number 17, Captain America, the first Avenger. Uh, my number 17 has to do with World War II also. Oh. But it's not Captain America. Okay. Um, in the waning days of the war when the Allies were about to free Paris, uh, the man in charge of Paris was given orders by Hitler to destroy everything. His name was General Dietrich von Choltitz, and he was supposed to destroy the city. He was um, operating out of a building in, in downtown France that had a lot of secret entrances, and into one of those entrances comes a gentleman from the Swedish embassy named Raoul Nordling to talk him out of it. Mm -hmm. The play-by-play -play between these two men forms the entire basis of the incredibly amazing, stupendously good 2014 French drama Diplomacy. Um, this is, uh, again, in French, uh, with brilliant um, uh, performances. By Andre Dussier as as uh, Nordling, who won my Poppy for Best Actor that year, and Niels Arstrup as Chultitz. Um It is mostly a two person movie. There are a few scenes with other people, but mostly they take place inside the office of of Admiral Chultitz. Um It is a true story. Um, how much there is actually uh, of the actual conversations that happened here. Nobody knows for sure. Mm -hmm. But um, it is a performance uh, tour de force. It's based on the play of the same name, which was a huge hit in French, France and Germany in the, 19, uh, in the 2000s. It won the César Award for Best Adaptation of a uh, Best Adaptation Film uh, at the 40th César Awards. It is a film that... If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it because the performances are just mind-blowing and the story is mind-blowing. You'll be riveted by the fact that it all happens within... Most of the film happens within a three- or four-hour period. There's some other stuff happening mm -hmm. peripherally, but it's it, it's it, it came and went so fast in America that nobody ever got a chance to actually see it. It played the candle for one week, 
which is how I got a screener. And it was like amazing. Um, and it is one of the best of the decade. My number 17 narrative for, for the 2000s is the 2014 French uh, drama Diplomacy. Okay. Uh, number 16 on my list is a film that you've already mentioned. Oh. And uh, it was one of the most beautiful, amazing animated films I've ever seen in my life. And I, <laughs> there's nothing that more... I really can't say very much other than what you said about it. My number 16 from 2017, the gorgeously animated Coco. We uh, talked about that on the last show. Um, directed by Lee Unkrich. Um, I can't, like I said, I can't really say more than you did, but I do <laughs> have to bring up one part. Mm -hmm. The ending, almost to the end, mm -hmm. where Miguel sings the song Remember Me <laughs> to Coco. His you mean the part where we were both blubbering like idiots? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, where he, where Miguel sings "Remember Me" to his beloved grandmother um, Coco, and um, she at this point is her life is waning, her her memory is going, and it just like I said last night. If that's if that scene or what we did the last show, I should say if that scene doesn't make you cry, I don't want to know you <laughs> because this movie that scene will touch absolutely anybody especially anyone who has lost a grandparent um mm -hmm. and yeah i was a complete sobbing wreck by the end of that scene and i am not a pretty crier um the crazy thing is i was actually watching a watch mojo clip of um it was like the most tear jerking scenes in in animated movies. Uh -huh. And I was watching it, and I was actually doing pretty okay. I'm just watching it and all that. And I'm like, okay. Then they get to remember me, and I have my hand pressed <laughs> up against my mouth because I'm trying not to start bawling so loud that I'm going to start sobbing. And I know he'd come running out of the computer room and be like, what? What's wrong? I'm like, I don't want to do that. So my number... I would have sat down and joined you probably. I know, and we both would have sat there and cried, <laughs> and that would have just wrecked the rest of the afternoon. So anyway, my number 16... Coco, one of the most beautiful movies I have ever seen. My number 16 is one of the most unusually formatted musical uh, biogra biographies that I've ever seen. It is a, it's a portrait of a man in two different worlds. And um, the man today is, is still regarded as one of the most genius musical people ever to walk the face of the earth. Mm -hmm. He truly was. Split between two wonderful actors playing him in different parts of his life. The film was truly, uh, it was seen by a lot of people, but not enough. It was mm -hmm. not the biggest hit it could have been. Um, uh, the one who played the younger one got my best actor that year, and uh, it became um, a movie that I understood because I'd heard so many things about what had happened both in the 60s and in the 80s. And even though I hadn't been that big of a fan of this band overall, there's a lot of their stuff everybody knows and everybody likes, and you can't miss. Uh, my number 16 is 2015's glorious biopic of Beach, Beach Boy Brian Wilson, Love and Mercy, with Paul Dano as Brian from the 60s, John Cusack as Brian from the 80s, Elizabeth Banks as... Melinda Ledbetter, his girlfriend in the 80s, and Paul Giamatti in an absolutely terrifying turn as Dr. Eugene Landry, the man who kind of took over Brian's life in the 80s. Um, it is stupendously good. Um, it's it's difficult to sit there, and, and, and Paul has talked about how difficult it was to play young Brian in some parts. I mean, they did the, the, a lot of the scenes that were done in the studios were improv. Mm -hmm. Paul was improving his dialogue, the rest of the band, the, the wrecking crew, playing the wrecking crew, uh, the session musicians, mm -hmm. uh, were improving. Um, but watching Brian fall into this abyss of abuse and drugs and mental illness, um, knowing what a freaking genius the man is musically, and he still is today, mm -hmm. um, it's it's heart wrenching, but you know the performances are terrific. 
Um, the music is mostly uh, lip synced, you know, by yeah. by the, by the uh, artists, and we get to see how Brian rebuilt his life with the help of Melinda Ledbetter uh, in the late '80s and uh, help with uh, from his from his brother Carl um, and Dennis and and cousins uh, who were part of the band. Um, it has really uh, been an, an eye-opening experience. Mm-hmm. And I knew from the moment it pre- I played, I think it premiered at Toronto, um, and, and I knew from the minute I saw it, yeah, from Toronto, it premiered at Toronto the previous fall. Um, and being a huge Paul Dano fan anyway, I knew he would bring what it took to do this, and, and he did. John Cusack was also stellar. Um, if you're, if you like the Beach Boys music, if you're a fan, um, it's definitely a must see if you haven't seen it. And, um, the performance, I mean, Paul was just stupendously good. Yeah. Number 15, 2015's Love and Mercy. I just gotta uh, say. 16, sorry. I just gotta say real quick, I actually goofed up with Coco. Um, Coco was actually Miguel's great grandmother, not right. his grandmother. Right. So that was yeah, my, sorry. my bad. That's okay. We will have. Documentaries 15 through 11 when we come back. Don't go away. Subject Cinema will return. T.C. Kirkham and Kim Brown. Subject Cinema. All right, Kristen, I am so excited that you've decided to do a podcast with me, but what are we going to do a podcast about? There's so many other movie podcasts. we got to do something original. Well, you know, I'm a big fan of Disney movies. What about something like that? That's just kid stuff. What do we want to do that for? Did you know that The Avengers is a Disney movie or that Pulp Fiction is a Disney movie? Pulp Fiction is not a Disney movie. It's technically owned by Miramax, which is part of Disney. We are still going to talk about the Disney animated movies, though, right? I thought you said that was kid stuff. Well, you know, I've got two kids. i got to be a good dad and stuff. So be sure to subscribe to the Walt Sent Me podcast, where we discuss the various subsidiaries of the Walt Disney Studio, including the animated movies. It's available on iTunes, Podomatic, and wherever you find great podcasts. And I swear, it's not kid stuff. Movies. Subject Cinema. Hey kids, welcome back. You're going to keep doing that, aren't you? <laughs> it's Subject Cinema's Best of the 2010s, Part 2. I'm T.C. Kirkham. Hi, I'm Kim Brown. Special three-part miniseries devoted to our favorite films of the past ten years. <laughs> and we're doing both narratives and documentaries. And we're back to our documentaries list and movies... 15 through 11. Mm-hmm. Great stuff in there. Um, I guess I started on that, right? Yep, you do. My number 15 is a film we've already discussed because you had it on your list earlier. Mm-hmm. And um, it is truly mind-blowing. I found out about the film when they had an article on it on, in Film Comment Magazine, and I told Kim, I said, let's watch for this. Um, and we both sat there and going, wow, this is just awesome. And I admit, like her... Uh, I had no interest in, in visiting Italy, <laughs> not really, until I saw this film, um, and it is absolutely breathtaking. My number 15 documentary of the 2000s is Passione from John Turturro. Um, it covers musical heritage of, of the Napo- uh, Napo- uh, Na- Neapolitan region around Napoli or Naples. Um, Turturro has done previously a lot of uh, writing and directing on narrative films. This was yep. his first attempt at a documentary, and it was brilliant. He's aided throughout much of this movie, not only by local people, but also by his friend and American star, uh, Broadway star mostly these days, Max Casella. Uh, it is um, really a, a fascinating look, and the music you see... And you look at this, it's like, wow, mm-hmm. this is just awesome. Yep. Um, you, it's a movie you won't ever forget once you see it. You talked so much about it, I'm not going to go any further. But it definitely, again, it should be on Amazon or Netflix, one of the two. It's a oh. terrific film, and it's at number 15 on mm-hmm. my documentaries list. 2011's Passione. Okay. Number 15 on my documentary list is a film that is really kind of all about perception. And it's also about assumptions and how we shouldn't have them. 
because just because you assume something doesn't make it so. Now, the reason I bring this up is because of the focus of this documentary that comes in at my number 15. Uh, my number 15 documentary for the past decade is Hava Nagila, the movie. <laughs> now, everybody knows the song Hava Nagila. Even if you don't think you know it, you do. Even if you're not Jewish, it's even so if well you're not, known. Yeah, yeah, even if you're not a person of the Jewish faith, you know Hava Nagila. Da, 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 you know that song. And you, me, and everybody else I know who haven't seen this movie all assumed that this song was hundreds, maybe even thousands of years old. You know, because people think, oh, you know, if it's if it's from the Jewish religion, you know, it's a very old religion, it's a very ancient people, and all that stuff like that. This song must be super, 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 super old. Nope. Uh, we found out from this film, which is a very informative, very funny educational film, that the song... Hava Nagila was written in 1915. <laughs> this song is just barely a hundred years old. Yeah. Uh, the film actually is from, I'm not sure when it was made because I can't find it. I think uh, it's 2012, I think. I'm not Something sure. like that, yeah. yeah. So that was kind of a kick in the head because it was like, what do you mean this film's from the 19, this song's from the 1900s? What? And Hava Nagila, the movie, Looks at also looks at all of the performers of this song, and believe me, there have been some people that have performed this song. I'm not saying they did a bad job, but it's just one of those head tilting, dog hearing a strange sound moment when you hear Harry Belafonte singing Have Nagila <laughs> or Glenn Campbell singing Have Nagila. Mm -hmm. It's just weird. But it works. It's amazing how it works. It was a really fun, interesting film. My number 15, Hava Nagila, the movie. Yeah, it was a lot of fun to see. Takes um, all your perceptions and chucks them right out the window. <laughs> uh, my number 14 is a film that Kim never saw, sadly, because I know she would have loved it. Um, it truly uh, came out of nowhere and ended up on my best of list that year. Uh, in uh, 2012, and it was <laughs> funny, brilliant, poignant, and you had to know it was just because of who it was about. You have uh, your average documentaries that look at different subjects, and then you have a whole group of documentaries that become more and more popular that are biographical documentaries, where they're talking about the subject or even with the subject. Mm-hmm. And this film attracted me because I'd been a fan for years from all of her television appearances and her movie appearances. And I have to say, it was just wonderful. <laughs> My number 14 documentary of the decade is Carol Channing, Larger Than Life, uh, about the inimitable Carol Channing, of course, Broadway star, movie star, television star, all around Diva of sorts. Never in diva personality. In good, diva in a good way. Never in, in, in horrible personality. Uh, Miss Channing graced this planet for almost 98 years. She passed away in uh, 2019, earlier this year, just a few days short of her 98th birthday. She was um, a bright light beacon to Broadway for much of the 60s and 70s. She was the person that America learned about Broadway from, from all her appearances on the various variety shows of the day, uh, ranging from Carol Burnett to Dick Van Dyke to, you know, all the shows in the 60s, like the Kraft Music Hall and the Dean Martin Show. And, you know, um, she was funny, talented, and everything you saw on TV was her, for real. She was really like that. There's a bit in this movie where she's talking to her old friend, Rich Little. Uh, I don't know how many of our generation, uh, outside of our generation, know who Rich is. He's not seen much on TV anymore. No. He's kind of semi-retired. But he was the best-known impressionist of his day. And he's sitting there going into her, his Carol Channing imitation. And like Richard Nixon before her, she's like, I don't think that sounds anything like me. 
<laughs> uh, my favorite imitation of Carol is Ryan Stiles. Ryan Stiles does her occasionally on Who's Line, and it's it's, yeah. it's hilarious. Um, she always loved people doing that, too. She thought it was great. Um, it's an amazing look at an amazing performer and her 70-plus year career. Um, and And... It is funny as hell from beginning to end because she's just such a great, bubbly person. And she's involved in the whole movie. Uh, and, and it's definitely worth checking out. My number 14 documentary of the 2000s, 2012's Carol Channing, Larger Than Life. Okay. Number 14 on my list of documentaries is one you've already mentioned. Um, City of Gold. Oh. The documentary about the late <laughs> lamented food critic Jonathan Gold and his Even work. Even though it almost made you yarp in your purse. It did. Yes. I'm gonna, <laughs> the hagfish story. Let, let's, let's talk about the hagfish story. Okay. I knew it was going to be on your list somewhere because I knew you loved it. Jonathan was a, you know, I mean, he went to like the, all of the restaurants that people usually go to, yeah. but he went to a lot of restaurants that people don't usually go to, which also made for a very interesting part of the film where he's talking about an Ethiopian restaurant and the hit that it took after 9-11, mm-hmm. because people were just nervous about trying anything foreign yeah. after 9-11, which is dumb. It is. But fear makes people do dumb stuff. But one of the places that he was talking about, you, you know, they use all the authentic food from their country, and um, this one country... Um, they don't have a lot of, you know, they don't have a lot of things like milk and things like that that they use in their baking and things like that. So they needed to use, they learned to use other things instead for milk and eggs and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. What they came up with was using this fish called a hagfish, which are these ugly looking things. That and exude a slime. Yes, they, when they are agitated, they exude this slimy gunk that they use as a thickening agent right. for food. Yeah. We actually got to see this oh, during the film. Don't remind me. Uh. I proceeded to sit there and have a violent gagging attack and almost threw up in my purse. Um, and that is not an exaggeration. No, that is not being us. melodramatic. That is me actually going, I'm going to hurl. I'm going to heave <laughs> into my bag. Um, but this, in this film is really, it's funny, it's educational, it's, it's very, it's very, very charming, and I'm so sorry that Mr. Gold passed away, because he was someone I would have loved to have sat down and maybe not shared a meal with, because some of that stuff I was like, yeah, no, pass, yeah. thank you. But I'd love to actually talk with him. Mm-hmm. Um, my number 14, City of Gold. Uh, my number 13 is another film that Kim did not see. Uh, I, I saw it by myself on video. Uh, almost th- almost two or three years after it came out. I was aware of it, but I never got a chance to see it when it came out because it was basically one of those one-night-only things around a few a couple of times. And normally we wouldn't include this, but it did get later a roadshow um, uh, screening around the country. Mm-hmm. So that's why I decided it was going to be eligible. Um you were talking in in in, in that uh, about 9/11 and and 9/11 has some has had some incredible effects on on people but no more so i think than the people who worked for Cantor Fitzgerald Cantor Fitzgerald was on the top 5 floors of the north tower they lost 658 out of their 900 employees um and the movie out of the clear blue sky uh, talks about their recovery and how they came back and how the survivors less than what they lost they lost two thirds of their of their workforce mm-hmm. um, pulled together to protect each other and then later on the the gentleman who ran Cantor Fitzgerald was vilified by the nine eleven families um, and and um, it I I sat and bawled through most of this movie. It is, I think, with the exception of the television produ- production of 101 Minutes That Changed America, it is the best 9-11 documentary out there. Um, and it, it will, um, it will rip through your soul when you watch these families who lost their loved ones, uh, turn on the man who owned this company who was helping to take care of them because they don't feel like they're getting enough. 
and he's trying to take care of all of his living employees as well. Mm-hmm. Um, it is an amazing film, and um, I, I, I have been touched forever by it. And you, you have to see it to understand. Um, available still on I, I'm Amazon Prime. I'm pretty sure it's not Netflix. Um, check it out if you get a chance. Number 13 on my documentaries for the do- for the decade, Out of the Clear Blue Sky from 2012. Okay. Um, number 13 on my list is much lighter than <laughs> yours, obviously. Um, because next to are light. It is dealing with a very beloved character. A very beloved character. And the people out there that bring that character to life every year... Ironically, around this time. My number 13 is a film from 2014, a documentary called I Am Santa Claus. I Am Santa Claus is looking at the men and their families, um, the men who portray Santa Claus all around the country. Um, There is actually an organization called the Fraternal Order of Real Bearded Santas. News to me. Yeah. But, you know, why not? Um, she happens to have a, a, a more a more personal stake in this. I do. So, I do. As yep. we both do. I actually do have, yes, I have, I have a horse in this race. <laughs> and um, we were lucky enough to actually get an autographed copy of this DVD uh, because we contributed to the Kickstarter. Is yeah. that where we got it? Yeah. One of the people that was, is a Santa... Um, I don't want to say impersonator because that sounds wrong. No. Uh, Santa actor? Santa, Santa's helpers. Santa helper. Yes, we'll go with Santa's helpers. Um, one of those people is um, author, actor, wrestling hardcore legend, and we're all not worthy. Lunatic. We're not worthy, we're not worthy, we're not worthy, uh, Mick Foley, um, who I have to say, not for nothing, is a freaking brilliant Santa. <laughs> I mean, oh my gosh. When, you, you well, met, this was the first year he'd done the whole thing. Yeah. Actually going gray for the for the Going gray, the getting the beard done absolutely perfectly. The thing is, you can tell when someone's phoning it in as a actor, and I say that as an actress. Yeah. Not trying to sound like a pretentious know-all, but you can definitely tell when somebody's phoning it in. None of these people are phoning in no, they're not. being Santa. These people love what they do. They do. Which uh, cannot be easy all the time because, let's face it, you know, sometimes kids that are meet Santa, their first reaction is to scream their tiny little lungs out, which I don't quite get, but they do. Um, when there's a point in the film where Mick comes to his own house as Santa and greets his kids, I'm sorry, I am sobbing my Heart out. Can I can I yeah. preface that a little bit? Yeah. One of Nick's kids is de- development d- disabled, and um, the younger one. Yeah, yeah. And the the look on his face when he sees this man, not realizing it's his father dressed yeah. up as Santa, is priceless. It's, it's so beautiful. beautiful. It is a beautiful, thing. beautiful moment. And I have been accused on more than one occasion by certain people in this room. Point. 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 That I cry. <laughs> That I cry very easily. By the end of this movie, I could have used a bucket <laughs> and a sponge. It is such a beautiful film. It will definitely it touch your heart. This is the perfect time of year to watch it. Go find it if you can. Uh, my number 13, which is actually Lucky 13, yeah. I Am Santa Claus. Uh, my number 12, you guys who know me will know You know, this is not going to be a surprise. I am an enormous extreme sports fan, and you're going to see several extreme sports documentaries in my top 12. <laughs> We're starting with the one at number 12. Um, it is, um, an, uh, it's the simplest of, of, of the films because it's just following around three 16 year olds who happen to live in a city that doesn't really exist anymore in California. Um, and, going through their lives for a year. Um, it was um, an interesting pick. We saw it at um, one of the Clotrudis uh, specials, I believe. We saw it in, at, at the Brattle originally. Um, it's interesting because uh, 
two of the people in the movie mix skateboarding with church, and it becomes a very interesting portrait of how one of them, who is more faithful than the other one, um, really has their lives upended and stuff. It's it, it's a fascinating story, and um, I have been following actually the career of one of them since since this film. Um, the movie is called Only the Young. It was shot in 2010 and released in 2000. Shot in 2009 and 2010 and released in 2012. And, um, or 2010, 2011 and released in 2012. Um, tells the story of three teenagers from Canyon Country, California, which is actually not really a city anymore. It's now part of Valencia, California, where not that far from where they shot wipe out and where they now shoot Holy Moly and mm-hmm. Magic Mountain Amusement Park. Uh, starring Garrison Saints, Kevin Conway, and Sky Elmore, the three kids who are profiled. Um, it is really quite a film um, and a look inside three kids who have a really deep friendship with each other, who love each other like brother and sister, and how their lives are going to be changing as they grow older. Mm -hmm. Um, The end of the movie, Kevin, who's the oldest of them, graduates from high school, uh, and and it's um, a really beautiful little film. Um, I don't know what Garrison and Skye have been up to. Kevin, I have kept an eye on. Kevin is is now a pro skateboarder, and um, it is (laughs) interesting to see him try and do this from Kentucky, where he's based out of now. Yep. But um, he, he is... Terrific! If you go on YouTube and watch some of his stuff, he's he, mind blowing. And his first ever AM contest is actually part of the movie mm-hmm. when he was sixteen. Um, I I adore this film. It's just a simple little film about friends. Skateboarding has to be happens to be a part of it, and um, it'll really touch you and put a smile on your face. My number twelve, two thousand thirteen's only the young. Okay. Number 12 on my list is another film that was really hard to watch because this person meant so much to both of us and meant so much to a lot of people. Um, He touched so many people's lives and was just an amazing human being, even though the character that he was most famous for playing was only half human. (laughs) <laughs> My number 12 is the 2016 documentary for the love of Spock, uh, celebrating the life of, um, Leonard Nimoy, the actor who was most famous as playing Spock in the 1960s series Star Trek, uh, who passed away on February 27th of 2015. This film is directed by his son Adam, and it is a love letter to his dad. And also a love letter to Spock. Mm-hmm. It, it is a it is a look at the man behind the character, who actually walked away from the character for a while, wrote a book about it called "I Am Not, I am Spock, not Spock," then wrote a book called "I, I am, am Spock, Spock," which kind of does make you go, "Make up your mind, <laughs> Leonard." Um, but he was this incredible person. He was an actor. He was an author. He was a musician. He was a proud Jewish man. He was a a very good human being. He wasn't a perfect human being, and this film doesn't make him out to be a saint. But he was Adam's dad. At the end of the day, he was Adam's dad. And as I mentioned previously, again, me and my hippy-dippy, earthy, crunchy, granola, (laughs) Woodstock way of thinking, (laughs) that... If your memory brings people joy, then you're not gone. No. And Leonard's not going to be Leonard gone. Leonard will ever. never be gone. <laughs> and there is a reason why we still say live long and prosper. Mm-hmm. And I think his memory always will. So my number uh, my number 12 favorite documentary of the decade for the love of Spock. <laughs> uh my number tw- my number 11 documentary is actually a sequel. It is a sequel to an earlier documentary um, that spotlighted um, a group of teenagers who revolutionized skateboarding in the 1970s. They were called the Zephyr Crew, and their film, uh, uh, call, uh, the uh, film called Dogtown and Z-Boys was actually written and produced by one of them, Stacy Peralta. 
that their their story later went on to become the 2005 dramatic film Lords of Dogtown. But after the Zephyr crew broke up, Stacy teamed up with another person and put together his own crew in the early 1980s. They were called the Bones Brigade, and Bones Brigade in autobiography is their story, once again written and narrated this time by uh, Stacy Peralta. Stacy also wrote the screenplay for Lords of Dogtown when it was out, mm-hmm. uh, telling the story of the early days of the, of the Bones Brigade, which included a 14-year-old named Tony Hawk, among others. I wonder what happened to him. And uh, so many people uh, who have come on to be true legends in skateboarding, including Rodney Mullen, Lance Mountain, Mike McGill, Christian Hasoy, uh, and uh, Steve Caballero, among others. Tony Alva also was part of it for a while. Um, It was weird because near the end, they're interviewing Lance Mountain, who is this day, in addition to still being on the, on the, I hate saying it this way, the Seniors Tour. I don't know what else to call it. I think they call it the Legends Tour as part of the... That sounds um, a little bit nicer. uh, The Skateboarders. He still dominates bowl competitions in these Mm -hmm. early 50s, mid 50s. Um, There's a point where Lance breaks down talking about the kind of life they had. These guys were known for making goofy videos. The most infamous is the search for Animal Chen, which you can still find out there. Um, that were, were You could tell none of them were very good at acting, but they were all putting their heart into it, and it was a lot of fun. Um, he breaks down on camera, and I'm sitting there bawling. <laughs> I've been a skateboarding fan since I was a kid. Never could do much on one, but I have loved watching them. You're one up on me. I don't think I've ever actually been on one. Yeah, I've been on one. I didn't, it didn't end yep, well. Yep, you're definitely um, one up on me then. I've had the pleasure of, of seeing now a, a live competition mm-hmm. when the Dew Tour came to uh, Boston in 2010. Yep. And it was um, really, it was something, yeah, it was hot that day. It was hot. But I got to see so many of my favorite people now in competition. Mm -hmm. Some of them were just getting known, and others are continuing legends in the business. Um, And so I get it. I get it. As a fan, um, this is even better than Dogtown and Z-Boys, which is just one of the greatest extreme sports documentaries of all time. I love this movie. It got a roadshow release around the country. It's available online. Never was released theatrical, but it was really a huge hit at Sundance. And um, I, I I could watch it over and over again. I, I truly love it. Yep. Number 11, Bones Brigade, the autobiography from 2012. I believe. Okay. Yep. Uh, number 11 of my favorite documentaries of the decade is one you've mentioned already. Um, the Road Movie. Oh, Wow. Okay. Good friggin' grief. <laughs> now, the reason... We this, talked about the road movie on our first show. Yes. The reason that so many people in Russia have dash cams is apparently, for what we find out from this film, because a lot of people in Russia try to perpetuate insurance fraud. The whole jumping in front of somebody's car and right. being all like, oh, you hit me, blah, blah, blah. So a lot of people have dash cams to protect themselves. And dash cams are an unblinking, unbiased eye. They see things, and sometimes they see things happen to you. Sometimes they see you happening to other people. Because not everything that happens in the road movie is, you know, something terrible happening to the driver. Some of the times it's Some of it's down, the like driver hysterical. causing terrible things. Like the like, two drunks that yeah, drive the like truck the two, into the river. Yeah, the two drunk idiots that drive a truck into oh, a river. Oh, we're now. <laughs> yeah, and aren't the least bit worried about it. And I don't mean they're in the river as in splash. Oh, they're darn. Actually you know, acting like they're driving now that they're floating yeah, down the river. The, the, the truck is pickup. not... Yeah, the truck is not <laughs> in the river as in... Oh, it's just sitting there in the water now. No. This river is large enough and the rapids are fast enough that this truck is Has going a boat now. down the river. <laughs> and these guys are completely like, oh, we're in the river now. Yeah. Oh, well. You know, it's, I'm like, a, <laughs> what? <laughs> this film has cows running into cars. 
This film has bears running in front of cars, which I didn't realize bears and could... And as, as we mentioned on the last show, the ubiquitous forest fire and yeah. people driving through it. I didn't realize bears could run that fast, <laughs> honestly. But the one, that, the one that I was like, okay, I will never complain about American drivers ever again, was the guy that was... He was in his car, so we're looking at things from his dash cam, mm-hmm. and he's shouting at another gentleman. <laughs> Other gentleman goes to his, he gets out of his car, goes to the trunk of his car, opens the trunk, takes out a sledgehammer, <laughs> and begins Guy to. Guy yelling starts backing up real quick. <laughs> and begins to th- approach the gentleman <laughs> in the car, looking rather like he doesn't want to just talk. <laughs> This film is, the one complaint I would have about it is that it's too short. It is too short. There and there are so occa- much more. And there are occasions when I'm going, but what happened next? I want to know what happened next. But it's just completely one of these, oh my gosh, moments. Yep. Uh, my number 11, The Road Movie. Wow. Yeah, it's something else from Oscilloscope Pictures, and you can see it on on, uh, on demand on Amazon. Mm-hmm. We have our number 15 through number 11 narratives of the decade coming up. When Subject Cinema returns. Blockbuster or bomb, it's all good for us. This is Subject Cinema. Want to be a part of Subject Cinema? Then email us. Your ideas, suggestions, and comments keep us going. Subject Cinema at PNRNetworks.com. Want to listen to Subject Cinema on the go? Check out Stitcher. You can access all the latest episodes right from iPhone or Android. Check it out. Click on the Stitcher logo on our sidebar or go to Stitcher.com and search for your favorite PNR Network show. Get started today. Real movies for real people. Subject Cinema. It's Subject Cinema's best of the 2010s and we're so happy you're here. Uh, helping us look at all of these great movies. I'm Kim Brown. I'm T.C. Kirkham, and we're counting up all of our narratives and uh, documentaries mm-hmm. for the past decade. It was a it was a bitch. It this was. was a bitch. Out of um, close to 500 films we've seen, that's why we ended up separating them into documentary and narrative because it would have been killing us if we had to put them in there. Um, so we're up to our narrative films from 15 to 11, mm-hmm. and I'm going to start with my number 15. Um, I want to say for the for the for the audience out there, this is the only kind of cheater in the group because while it came out to festivals in 2009, it didn't actually go into general release anywhere in the world until late 2010 and here in America in 2011. So that qualifies it as a movie for this decade. Yep. I also want to warn people: this is the movie is the perfect example of an old adage we have said uh, mentioned before. Just because it's animated does not mean it is appropriate for children. Right. Kim had one on on her first on our first show, Rocks in Our Pockets, mm-hmm. which is a do, a, a documentary. Um, and mine is this one at number fifteen, the true story of a of a well known uh, author and his love for his, his Alsatian bitch. Uh, in the movie, uh, in the real life, the the dog was called Queenie. Mm-hmm. In the movie, it is my dog Tulip. Um, my dog Tulip is quite simply the funniest film ever made. Um, it really is. It is uh, animated beautifully, um, produced and uh, directed by Paul Fierlinger, and produced by Norman Kaminsky, uh, Frank Pellegrino, and Norman Twain. Uh, based on J.R. Ackerley's writings uh, and uh, uh, with wonderful performances by Christopher Plummer as the novelist uh, and also Isabella Rossellini as the veterinarian and Lynn Redgrave in her final performance as uh, 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 as Ackerley's sister, Nancy. Mm-hmm. The movie focuses on Ackerley's love and attention he he. He he, uh, he lavishes on this dog named Tulip that he rescued from a family that really couldn't take care of her. Right. She has severe bathroom problems. She is... Um, uh, <laughs> um, a lot of the humor in the movie is, is, is 
based around the dog's bowel movements and sex life, sex life, which is how the book is that it's based on. Yep. It goes into enormously unnecessary detail about the bodily functions of a German shepherd female. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it is absolutely hilarious all the way through. I Not all the way through. Well, m- well, there was a couple of small parts mm. in there, but I mean, I was literally on the freaking floor laughing so hard mm-hmm. through about two-thirds of this film. Kim was looking at me like, oh, my God, are you crazy? Um, but it was, I, I love this film, and anybody who has a chance to see it, please watch it. Watch it without kids. It's not a kid's film. Nope. Um, oh, well, well, okay. It's not for kids under the age of 16, maybe. Nope. After that, fine. Um, but it is brilliant, and, and if you have a problem, if you get triggered by bathroom issues or sex issues, you may not like it, although both of those are involving the dog, not accurately. No. Um, it, it's a, a riot, and, and everybody should see it. Number 15, Narrative, 2011's Delor- Gloriously and Deliriously Funny, My Dog Tulip. Okay. Number 15 on my list of uh, top uh, 30 movies of the decade. Narratives. Narratives. Um, yet another superhero movie. Yep, doing it again. Uh, number number 15, 2016's Doctor Strange. I have been a Doctor Strange fan for a very long time. I've always thought this character was awesome simply because he his look was based on Vincent Price. His middle name is Vincent. And if they couldn't get Vincent to play the part, which I still think would have been amazing at some point back in the 70s, why this didn't happen, I don't know. Well, he was too busy doing Dr. Fibes and stuff that Yeah, time. I guess. Um, they got the next best thing when they decided to do this in 2016 with Benedict Cumberbatch cast as Dr. Stephen Strange, a very arrogant uh, neurosurgeon who suffers a debilitating accident and finds out that you really do have to be flat on your back to be able to finally look up and see the stars. <laughs> um, it's true. Yeah. His journey from arrogant mortal to becoming the Sorcerer arrogant, Supreme. Arrogant sorcerer hey, supreme. hey, 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 hey. He is, honey. His arrogance has not gone away. It's been tempered a little bit, but it has not gone away. Okay, that's fair. Okay, um, fair enough. He doesn't go through a complete Let's personality. Let's face it this way. You don't want to put him and Tony Stark in the same room because their egos will clash. Even though that happened. It did. Uh, in and Avengers uh, Infinity War. Yeah, and it was pretty funny. Um, I loved this film. I thought it was just, it was trippy. It was beautifully shot. I know there was a lot of uh, controversy about casting... Um, um, I'm sorry, I just completely went blank. Uh, I'm so sorry. Um, Tilda Swinton, Tilda Swinton. As, the, as the ancient one. S- since in the original comic, this character is a An male. Asian man. A very old Asian and here male. And an Irish woman. Yes. Bald, and, but Irish woman. Yeah. Was. And, you know, I understand the controversy and all that, and I get it. So we're not going to touch that on that. It was just, like I said, this film was trippy. It was magnificent. I loved Benedict Wong. As Wong, he was amazing, and anything with Mads Mikkelsen in it instantly gets a bump up in my book. Mads Mikkelsen as the human big bad Kaecilius. He's not the actual big bad. You find out who that is later on in the film. Um, is just fantastic. Some of the fight scenes literally have me sitting there with my jaw just dropped open, and it's also really funny in some parts. Um, my number 15, Doctor Strange. Okay. Okay. Uh, my number 14 is um, one of those little feel-good movies that you don't, you're don't you not sure what to expect from it. This thing had a, a great pedigree. And the person that was the writer-director, whose earlier films we were a huge fan of, and Pat that it was the third movie in a trilogy of films about basically... Separate but still connected music stuff. Um, and I, I, I was like, we were not sure. We'd heard it was good. It had premiered at Sundance. When we went to the free screening of it that we had tickets for at the Candle Square, uh, it was sold out and everybody there fell in love with the, with the people and the story and the music and everything about it. And it became one of our favorite films. 
Um, 2016 was a banner year, and and uh, this movie not only delivered in terms of uh, the way it played, because the movie is just flows so well, but also uh, in the way that it made is is on the verge of currently uh, was the starting place for four very fast rising performers, and really um, blew our minds. Number 14, 2016's wonderful film from director John Carney, Sing Street. Sing Street is possibly the best musical of the 2010, 20, of the 2000s so far. Mm-hmm. Uh, with original music provided by the gentleman that wrote, was part of, um, Danny Wilson in the 1980s. They had a big hit called Mary's Prayer. Mm-hmm. Um, his name is, um, let me find it here. Um, oh, it doesn't have it, of course. Um, the story tells the story of mid eighties in Ireland, uh, and, and a family that's been sending their son to private school suddenly has to send him to, per, uh, to parochial school because they don't have the money for to private school anymore. His older brother's a dropout. He was a drug head and just lives at home. And the family, the mother and father, are having this divorce issue, which they can't do because at the time divorce was still illegal in Ireland. Um, so Connor ends up at Sing Street, uh, S-Y-N-G-H Street, um, the school in his neighborhood, where he's impressed by a girl standing across the street while coming home from one of his, uh, first days there. Um, completely taken by Rafina, as she calls herself, she's going to be a model. He asks her if he wants, if she wants to be in his band's music video. To which she says, oh, sure, I suppose. Can you really sing? And we get this kind of off-key rendition of Take On Me. Um, she says she'll think about it. So he goes back over to his new buddy um, over uh, across the street who's waiting for him. Uh, his name is Larry. And he's like, well, what's she say? He says, oh, well, she's going to be in the video for us. Now we just have to put together a band. Um <laughs> the resulting story is charming, funny, delicious music, fun all the way around. John Carney, the creator and writer of Once and Begin Again, finishes his trilogy beautifully. The movie made stars out of its four semi-leads or co-leads. Um, Lucy Boynton, who plays Rafina, uh, who just suddenly is now exploding thanks to Bohemian Rhapsody. Mm-hmm. The wonderful... Um, uh, Jack Rayner, who is much better here than he was in the, uh, not not his fault in the god awful Mark Wahlberg Transformers movie the year before, the deliciously beautiful talents of Mark McKenna. Mark is not known that well as a musician here yet. He's known mostly as an actor from YouTube's critically acclaimed comedy series Wayne, and one of the most beautiful singers I've ever heard, uh, Ferdia Walsh Pilo in the lead role of Connor. Cosmo, as they call him later in the movie, Lawler. Uh, Ferdy is a, has a voice sent from heaven, and man, does it show. Um, we were fortunate to see Ferdy and Mark, who were there live for our screening to perform, and it was just awesome. They are they are true awesome people, and the movie is awesome, and the music is awesome, particularly Drive It Like You Stole It, which is their Hall & Oates rip-off, and, and um, deserves so much more than it got. I was surprised they did not get a Best Song, a best song nomination at the, uh, at the uh, Oscars. It's just... You, you, if you have a bad day, this is the perfect movie to put on and mm-hmm. put a smile on your face. From 2014, my number... 2016, sorry. My number 14 narrative of the decade, Sing Street. Okay. Number 14 on my list is a film that I was, like, really concerned about when I heard they were doing this again because I'd already seen it once before and gotten burned. My number 14 kicked off Legendary's Monsterverse from 2014, directed by Gareth Edwards. His return to the screen, Godzilla. (laughs) Godzilla 
was a film that I was really looking forward to, but at the same time a little trepidatious about because we had to deal with Fluffy the Giant Iguana back in in the 2000s with um, Roland Emmerich's Godzilla. No, actually before that it was 1998. 1998, I'm sorry. Yeah, Roland Emmerich's Godzilla, a.k.a. Fluffy the Giant Iguana, a.k.a. Fraudzilla. (laughs) Um, I was very, very, very pleased with 2014's Godzilla. Godzilla portrayed the character of Godzilla as more than just a guy in a suit. This is an actual character. This is an actual force of nature, an avatar of planet Earth, which does not mean the same thing as being a defender of humanity. And the other characters that were in the film, including um, Aaron Taylor Johnson and Elizabeth Olsen, as a young couple who, with their son, wind up being impacted by not only Godzilla, but by the Mutos, the other creatures that are in the film. And who had just come off playing brother and sister in, in Age of Ultron. Yeah. Is, ew. Yeah. But at least they both made it to the end of this movie. Oh, shut up. Anyway. Unlike, oh, shut up! Unlike Brian Cranston, if you went into this as a Breaking Bad fan because of the trailers, boy, were you disappointed. But the rest of us weren't. I loved this film. This film did Godzilla proud. I absolutely loved it. It had a battle sequence at the end that almost had me jumping up and screaming in the theater from sheer joy of watching the magnificence that is the King of the Monsters, although that would be a later film. Um, (laughs) My number 14, Godzilla. Hail to the King, baby. My number 13 is... um was an eye-opener because I had never been able to stand this director's films before. And I, I just just found them to be really pretentious and stupid and, and whatever. Um, this film changed that for me, although I don't know that I would actually like anything else he's done that I haven't seen yet. But um, I love this film because it is quirky, it is funny, it is full of, uh, full of action and adventure. And has some of the best, I mean, has one of the best casts of all time. It just, it really does. It also features our, our rising, a number one male rising star for that year, and it, it was really, really something. My number 13 is 2014's, um, 2014's entry into the catalog of Wes Anderson, The Grand Budapest Hotel. Mm-hmm. Oh my god, this movie is fall down funny from beginning to end. Featuring uh, Ray Fiennes, F. Marie Abraham, Matteo Almerich, Adrian Brody, Willem Dafoe, Jeff Goldblum, Harvey Keitel, Jude Law, Bill Murray, Edward Norton, Cersei Ronan, Jason Schwartzman, Leah Seydoux, Tilda Swinton, Tom Wilkinson, Owen Wilson, and introducing Tony Revolori, who went on to win our Best uh, Actor uh, Rising Star that year. Um, or, or maybe he was number two, I forget. He was one of the top two. Um, this movie tells the story of a fictional hotel in a fictional country just before the beginning of a fictional war and the misadventures of M. Gustav, the man who runs the hotel, uh, assisted by his lobby boy, Zero, um, when he is willed a painting worth a fortune by an old woman who he has been having an affair with for 20 years and whose family is desperate to cut him out of the will. Um... This I've never seen Ray Fiennes having more fun in a movie, except possibly in Bruges, uh, where he is just letting loose and having all kinds of fun. He and Tony Revolori are dynamite together. Their chemistry is brilliant, um, and and the movie itself is will just have you going, what the, what 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 do you mean, what what happened, what what oh oh my god, really, all the way through the film. It's funny as hell. It's shot in anamorphic, which is the standard uh, Academy standard for years ago. It's not a widescreen film, and it has some old-fashioned camera tricks, yep, m- miniatures and stuff. Um, it's amazing, and um, I, I don't know that I would ever forever be a fan of Anderson's films from this point on. But this is easily his most publicly accessible film. Number 13, The Grand Budapest Hotel from 2014. Okay. Number 13 on my list is on here because I really enjoyed it. 
and also because I really needed it. Because the film before it in the series completely broke me. Um, my number 13 is from 2019, directed by Anthony Russo and Joe Russo, Avengers Endgame. Actually being able to pick myself up after Avengers Infinity War was an actual feat in and of itself <laughs> because I was a complete emotional wreck by the end of that film. And even though certain people were like, well, you know what's going to happen in the next movie, blah, 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 blah. I don't blah, feel blah. so good, Mr. Stark. Because certain people didn't want to put themselves in the movie and feel it all emotionally, you know. I did. Eventually. Eventually. I needed this movie. I needed this movie like a drowning person needs a life preserver. Um, Even though there's some stuff in this that's worse than what happened in Infinity War. Yes, there is. But I needed it. I needed to see these Well, characters. who said it was all about your needs, huh? <laughs> Every once in a while it is. This okay. is one of those times. Um, dealing <clears throat> with the events of... Avengers Infinity War and dealing with the results of the snapocalypse or however you want to word it. Um, this film, oh my gosh, there were so many points in this film where I just literally had my hand squished up against my lips because I was like, if I don't do this, I'm going to scream. You know, from whatever reason, joy, sorrow, rage, anything in between. Um, the end of this movie, once again, I am a complete sobbing mess at the at the outcome of the battle at the end of this film, although I had actually started crying before that. Um, the crazy thing is, as much as I love this film, the reason it's so high on my list is because of what's come out after it. The, uh, the number of people, the number of very brilliant people who are way smarter than me, that have been able to go on YouTube and add to the end of the film... With their own well, interpretation. They didn't need to do, but they're, they're entertaining all the, all the same. They're not, well, they're, you can always use more help. And some, some of those were just like, okay, that's awesome, that's awesome, that's awesome. Oh my gosh, why didn't that happen? That would have been amazing. Um, but I loved this film. It was just the perfect ending to that chapter of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And more importantly, it makes me look toward the road ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, my number 13, Avengers Endgame. My number 13 could not be further from that. <laughs> okay, well, that's cool. That's cool. It is a serious... Um, it, this movie is, is so breathtakingly stunning from beginning to end um, that you, you will be amazed by it. It's going to be shown in film schools for years for the techniques used. Because they manage to make a movie that is riveting and, and keeps your attention and keeps your heart pounding with maybe 20 words of dialogue in the entire film. It won my best picture for 2013 and opened my eyes to the true ability of someone I've always liked but never really had seen do something this good in years. The legendary Robert Redford. My number th uh, 12 movie of the decade is 2013's All is Lost. That almost made my list. Um, J.C. Chandor, coming off his first big hit, Margin Call, took Redford, who is the only cast member, has very few words. It is all told from the perspective of the man who is lost at sea after an accident with his boat and who is trying to repair it and then get going, and then he's involved in a storm, and he loses this and that. The cinematography is mind-blowing. Alex Ebert's score is mesmerizing. And Redford's performance, as I said, maybe consisting of 20 words for the entire dialogue of the film, is just incredible. The man did all of his own stunts at 73 years old, mm -hmm. and I'm like, wow. Uh, this is really something. Um, if you if you miss this in the theater, you should be watching it. I would actually advise you to find a repertory theater in your area and have them put it on the big screen. Oh, yeah. Because it is it it it, it doesn't it, it holds up fine. But if you've not seen it, 
seeing it on a big screen should be your first priority. Definitely. Um, because it is just amazing. My number 12 picture of the 2010s, 2013's best picture poppy winner, All is Lost. Okay. Number 12 on my list is actually, the ironic thing about this film is that you knew coming into it, you already knew the end of it. You already knew that the characters in the film, for the most part, were not going to make it to the end of the film. You knew that. And this you, just missed my time. You 30. almost want to steel yourself against caring about these characters because of that. But you can't. Mm-hmm. Because the characters are that compelling. Their story is that compelling. Mm-hmm. Even though you know that you're going to say goodbye to them before the end of this film. Mm-hmm. My number 12 is Rogue One, A Star Wars Story, from 2016, directed by <laughs> Gareth Edwards. There's that name again. <laughs> um, Rogue One looks at what actually is we see at the beginning of Star Wars Episode Four: A New Hope, the whole thing with the plans for the Death Star that were given to... Princess Leia, and that she's on the run from the Empire from, and all of that. And those of us who went, well, where'd the plans come from? How'd they get them, and all this stuff like that? We find out, because those are questions we actually wanted answered. Did we? I did. Okay. A lot of people wanted to know where that stuff came from, and now we know. From Even this- though that there was no reason for it, except as a MacGuffin for the start of the first movie, or well, the fourth movie, whichever way you're looking at it. Um... Felicity Jones as Jin Erso, Diego Luna as Cassian Andor, Ben Mendelsohn in a an incredible turn as Orson Krennic, and Mads Mikkelsen once again playing an actual sympathetic part for a change mm-hmm. um, as uh, Galen Erso, and of course the inimitable Donnie Yen as <laughs> Jared Imway, um, who is absolutely amazing because it's Donnie friggin' Yen. <laughs> This film just had me sitting there through the entire thing with my jaw just dropped open. And this that feeling again, that feeling of being a young person and watching Star Wars for the first time and being swept up in the majesty of all of it. And like I said, you know that most of these characters are not going to make it out of this movie. Mm-hmm. And... You do wind up caring yeah. a lot, and it hurts It is easily a my favorite lot. Star Wars film ever. But it's a good pain, and you carry it like a badge of honor. Mm-hmm. Uh, my number 12, Rogue One, A Star Wars Story. Okay, my number 11. This is a film I did not expect to even see, let alone like. We were When it was announced as coming out, we were like, mm, really? Why are they remaking that? This is, what's the purpose? The first one bombed. We sat back and were watching as a production and, you know, saw who was getting involved. And then the first trailer came out and utterly blew both of our minds. It was like, holy cow, this is nothing like they did the first time. Mm-hmm. It's a completely different story. Well, the same basic premise with a new background, and it's not a musical this time. It's a straightforward drama. Um. I was bawling most of this movie. I was sitting there in tears from the beginning because I had started to cry just from watching the majesty of the of the trailer. Something magical was happening in my head and I didn't expect it. What most pleased me was the resounding agreement of the critics around the country who declared it one of the best movies of that year. And it deserved to be. 2016 kills me because there's so many good movies that year. I had such a hard time with all the awards that year. Um, and now at number 11 on my top movies of the decade sits another movie from that year. Walt Disney Company's incredible remake of Pete's Dragon. The story of, of, of Pete Lowry who is orphaned at five uh, during in a road crash where he is befriended as he's being chased by wolves in the woods where their car crashed. Um, he's rescued by a dragon, a real dragon. Um, a real green fuzzy dragon. Yeah. Um, and the story jumps a few years. 
uh, where Pete has been living with Elliot, the dragon, for six years. He named the dragon Elliot after a character in the book that he was carrying when it, when the car crashed. Um, ends up getting discovered and taken back to town and trying to understand about love, life, how things should be, and what really happened to him and who he really is. Um, I have never been a huge fan of, and I don't mean to be mean when I say this, I have never been a huge fan of Bryce Dallas Howard. I like her, but I'm not overly well, overwhelmingly huge fan. Mm-hmm. She won me over huge here, like Amy Adams did that year and, and other things too. Mm-hmm. Um, as Grace, the forest ranger who comes across Pete. Uh, Pete is played by a marvelous young actor and our number one rising star of that year. Or 2017, actually. He didn't get it to the following year. Uh, Oaks Fegley. Also with Wes Bentley, Carl Urban, Una Lawrence, and Robert Redford again in a stellar performance. Um, it's a, just a beautiful feel-good movie with adults believing the kids that they're talking, they're talking to. Yeah. Instead of pretending like they don't know what they're just imagining things. Yep. Because in this case, Grace's father, the Robert Redford character, had also run into a dragon when he was a boy. And um, the story is just fantastic. They did it right this time. The first movie was terrible. They really did. And, I, I mean, it was bad. Not Helen Reddy, Jim Dale, Shelley Winters notwithstanding. It was a bad film. This one is anything but, and is my number 11 film of the decade, 2016's Pete's Dragon. Okay. Number 11 on my list is um, is a film that I really was kind of like, what? Why do we need this when I heard they were doing it? <laughs> and I felt that way for quite a long time. And then I actually started seeing the trailers for it. And then we actually saw it. And I was like, this is terrific. <laughs> it's not what I remember from when I was a kid. It's actually better than what I remember from when I was a kid because that was all about shoving morals down kids' throats. Oh. My my number 11 is from 2019, Shazam, uh, directed by David F. Sandberg. Shazam is the story of Billy Batson, a, a young man who has been bounced through the foster system because he was abandoned by his mother. And... He winds up becoming the chosen one, the one who will take up the mantle of Shazam, who is also the name of the wizard that gives him his powers. And when he says the name Shazam, he becomes this adult superhero with all of these amazing powers who used to be called something else. Captain Um, Marvel. Um... Now, the big the thing, red cheese. The thing is, the interesting thing about this film is the whole idea that you have the hero's journey, the whole idea that this young man, you know, becomes a superhero and instantly he becomes filled with the, you know, the, the powers that he has and becomes this hero that goes out there and does good and all this stuff like that. That's somebody else's story. That's not this story. Because the thing is, He might be a grown adult with all of these powers, but he has to learn to become a hero. And he has to learn that the power to become a hero, if you have all of these abilities and stuff like that, that doesn't make you a hero. Who you are inside and who loves you makes you a hero and makes your family. Um, A very wise man on another TV show once said, family don't end with blood. And this film is definite proof of that, that family might not be the people you're genetically tied to, but sometimes the family that you make is much better than the family you were born into. Mm -hmm. And also the fact that this movie is just frigging hysterical. Um, It's way better than it deserved to be. Yeah, in quite a number of scenes. Um, So my number 11, Shazam. All right, so now you've got our numbers 30 through 11 yeah. of our favorite documentaries and narratives Oof. for this decade. And on our final show, we will count up our top 10. Um, I have all but two movies, all but one official movie 
that was named my best picture are in my top 30. Mm -hmm. The only one that missed it was 2014's Stand Clear of the Closing Doors. And I did not actually name Black Panther my best picture because we didn't see enough last year, but it was my favorite film of the year. It also missed. The other ones are all here, and the rest of them are in the top 10, and we'll get to those. What about you? Um, my films are kind of all over the road as usual because it is me, but, um, there's a, de- there's definitely some films in here that were my, um, poppy, my, my rosies that year for best film. Like I said, it's kind of all over the road, but that's me. It's complicated. It's complicated. Now that's not in there actually. Oh, well, it shouldn't be. Surprisingly it's enough, no, it's not in there. <laughs> but you'll have to come back to find out what is. Yeah, so, Until next time, we've got more great stuff and our final part of our Best of the Night of the 2010s miniseries. I'm T.C. Kirkham. I'm Kim Brown. For Subject Cinema, may your popcorn always be buttered. And may your roses always be in bloom. We'll see you next time. Bye. Podcasting's choice from coast to coast, continent to continent, right here 24-7.